Uh, my name is Khalil. Uh, okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the summer lecture series. Uh, welcome also to the listeners that are also here. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Oren Promenik and I will be co-chairing today. Um, so let's get started with our journal club. Our first presenter will be Ms. Ruth from Valley Stream North High School. Um, so Ms. Ruth, do you mind sharing your screen with us? Yeah, thank you for the introduction, by the way. One second. You guys can see my screen, correct? Yep. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, Oren. My name is Ruth Albermudia, and I'll be presenting the World Rugby Guidelines for Concussion Guidance. So this guideline mainly focused on identifying the signs of concussion and really emphasizing that they can happen at any age but mostly putting adolescents at the forefront of, of the guidelines. With this, they aim to provide guidance as it is a guideline on mainly non-elite rugby, and they are obviously focused on concussions and also suspected concussions. They mainly did this by detailed descriptions on how to identify and diagnose concussions, and they even recommended a program to help players recover on a stepwise program called the Graduated Return to Play Program. So overall concussion injuries can be succinctly defined as a traumatic brain injury resulting in the disturbance of cognitive and brain function. It's also important to note that the guideline detailed specifically that an LOC or loss of consciousness is not a requirement by diagnosing concussions, but could be an indication that a concussion has been sustained. It is also important to note that a brain scan is also not a reliable test of whether a player has endured a concussion or if they're being examined for a concussion. The two main populations that are at risk for concussions are children and adolescents, as when they sustain concussions, they could take longer and also sustain more intense damage to the brain, such as increased memory and mental processing issues. And once they have sustained one or multiple concussions are more susceptible to rare and dangerous neurological complications. And it can even be as intense as death. Also, recurrent or multiple concussions that are sustained by an adult as well could lead to further brain damage or injury and an overall slower recovery time. The guidelines go on to clearly state indicator, indicators excuse me, of a concussion, and these are not limited to, but do include seizures, um, just fits, loss of consciousness, confirmed or suspected, but cannot be solely used to diagnose, unsteady or overall just unbalance, an unbalancedness or overall poor coordination, confusion and overall just being disorient, disoriented and not aware of where they are or what time it is. In managing concussions um, with regards to specifically on-field management, a player with a concussion or suspected should be immediately and permanently removed from training or play and the appropriate emergency management procedure should be followed and implemented, especially if neck injury is involved. And after, the player should rest their body and their brain as well. It's also important to note that there is a distinct difference between adult and children. As, as stated before, children can endure more intense damages. So children being under 18 years old should have a minimum of two weeks recovery, which includes phys physical rest and cognitive rest as well. The guideline uh, ends the article by recommending a stepwise program for both children and adults to recover 
effectively from injury called, as mentioned before, the graduated return to play program. And it should only be implemented or started once physical rest, either the two week or the one week cognitive and physical rest have been completed and medication or other treatments have been stopped. And it's important to emphasize that this is a slow process and it is stepwise and it is for a reason. It's to make sure the player eases back into play and is overall healthy as they recover. To conclude, recovery time in children is higher, but it is needed because they are more at risk to sustain more intense effects, the more intense effects of concussions, and in adults, it is lower. And overall, it is recommended that in all cases of concussion, no matter if they are children or adult, that the player is referred to a medical professional for diagnostics, diagno diagnosis sorry, and guidance as well as return to play decisions, even if the symptoms resolve or even if the medication is stopped. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Are there any questions? I'll just stop sharing, if that's OK. Is, do I stop sharing, Oren? Yes, please, Ruth. OK, thank you. Thank you, Ruth, for that wonderful presentation. And uh, welcome, Dr. Ma, for joining us today. So, um, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Welcome, Dr. Ma. I just wanted to bring up one point about um, um, Ruth's uh, discussion and uh, topic. And that's uh, obviously, it, there's always uh, terminology flying around. Um, Traumatic brain injury versus concussion, right? So to have a traumatic brain injury, I want you to all remember that it's a brain dysfunction versus a concussion, which is a brain injury. So what we've seen with concussions are that vomiting, uh, acute memory loss or fatigue. And then when you have a uh, brain dysfunction, you know, you have persistent headaches or a nerve injury that affects the athlete in our, in our consideration. And there's usually difficulty concentrating. So therefore, these are more long-term um, or sequelae that are, have, are drawn out. Um, another term um, I want to bring up, and I'm sorry to be so brief, but and it's, that, it's the post-concussion syndrome. And um, the problem comes down is that it's very, very complex to try to describe this, um, such as headaches and dizziness. And the last for weeks and months, um, it, it's very hard to try to describe these terminology, but this is someone who's had either a traumatic brain injury, obviously, and concussions fall under traumatic brain injuries. And then they, it lasts for a very long time uh, leaving the athlete or the injured person with such a uh, uh, big um, spectrum of symptoms that it's difficult to really try to gauge what's going on. So these are just some of the terms I wanted to bring up. And uh, please, um, we'll, we'll discuss those at another time, but please continue. Did anyone have questions on those? I'm sorry. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. So we will be continuing with our journal club. And our next presenter is Mr. Swan from University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. Sam, would you mind sharing your screen? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Oren, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you guys for the opportunity to present uh, so as you know, I'm the National Study Coordinator. Uh, my lecture today will be a journal club of sports injuries and illness incidents in the Rio de Janeiro Olympic Summer Games, a prospective study. Um, so a little overview of this study is that back in 2008 during the Beijing Olympics, the IOC developed the IOC Injury Surveillance System, which was their version of an injury reporting mechanism for their elite category of Olympic athletes. And ever since then, they've used this survey system 
uh, in their future Olympic Games, both the Winter and Summer Olympics, and it really becomes a very unique data set. Um, and so the aim of today's uh, Journal Club is to describe their uh, pattern of injuries and illnesses sustained in the 2016 Rio Olympics. Uh, and once again, this is a prospective cohort study from using the exact the IOC injury surveillance system. Uh, and it's a unique time. Um, if, uh, if we did not have this COVID-19 situation, the Olympics actually would have started next week. So um, just an interesting point in time. Um, with this, I'm a little brief with the definitions, uh, specifically because I want to focus on how it's how similar uh, our work today is with what the IOC is doing up at the Olympic level. And specifically, I want to talk about how they documented their injury. So this is the main point that I want to look at. Um, and this is actually their 2016 uh, IOC injury surveillance system. Now, unfortunately, many of you guys were not able to aid in data collection uh, during the summer Olympic or during the summer uh, season. Uh, but one thing for the people that have, uh, I don't know if you, Ruth or Liliana, have actually gone about and gone to the field and recorded data, but it's very similar and unique to how they do it at the Olympic level uh, by categorizing the injury. Um, in this case, the IOC does add a little bit more to their study where they talk about illnesses as well. And then there's a further classification system. And basically when the study implemented this uh, injury system, they went about for the however so long the Olympic was, and they produced their results from there. Um, they totaled a, uh, over 1,100 injuries, and overall it was 9.8 injuries uh, per 100 participating athletes. This is a little different from some of the literature we've seen in the past Journal Club where we do over 1,000 player hours, but I believe it makes up to about uh, 5.6 injuries per 1,000 player hours. Now, overall, uh, one thing that I found unique was with the rugby injuries, um, rugby injuries, we noticed that there are 18.6 injuries per 1,000, uh, 100 participating athletes. Um, and if you look at the, the graph, you can see that it was towards the higher end of the injuries uh, with cycling, BMX, and boxing up pretty high. And I'll talk more about that later, but now to the other key results that I noticed is that 71% of the injuries uh, occurred by the Olympic athletes were actually just acute injuries whereas only 27 were overuse injuries. Um, with causes and mechanisms, contact uh, with another athlete constituted 28%, that was the highest, followed by non-contact at 21, and then overuse with gradual onset types of injury mechanisms at 19%. Furthermore, uh, when we talk about the actual injury sustained by the Olympic athletes, uh, anatomically, a lot of the injuries occurred uh, in the lower extremity. Here, it's subcategorized as you know, the knee, the thigh, so the proximal lower extremity were some of the highest number of injuries that occurred, uh, followed by the ankle, uh, face. Those were other parts that had sustained quite a few injuries. Specifically with the injury types, you had the sprain and ligament ruptures, contusions, hematomas, strains, bruises, lacerations. One thing I found interesting is I did not actually note a fracture anywhere for the top injury type, which is another point of discussion later on. Now, this was a big study to really simplify into just one journal club. They implemented an injury uh, surveillance, but they also discussed uh, illnesses, which I didn't try to discuss about too much, just to maintain a certain scope. Uh, but regarding the, the illnesses, there was, they actually, uh, only 5% of all of their athletes occurred in illness. Uh, that 5% uh, can be compared to the 8% of the actual injuries, not illnesses at 5%, but injuries occurred at 8% of all the athletes. Um, another unique part though about the injuries specifically is that the Rio 2016 Olympics had a lower injury percentage compared to Beijing, Vancouver, London, Sochi, and even it's uh, the 2018 Olympics that happened afterward at 12%. So that was the unique part that makes uh, the Rio uh, 2016 Olympics evidence very encouraging to the direction of sports medicine. And these last two points that I have, uh, really, uh, I want to just emphasize how important this entire study was overall. Uh, when we go back to the main authors, right, these were some of the top people in sports medicine and just how important this study was to really understanding how 
special the Olympics are in general, right? The Olympic athletes are, uh, they're your top athletes. So having this evidence is very encouraging to see like the direction of sports medicine overall. Um, and besides that, that is all I really have to discuss. <clears throat> Great song, nice and succinct. All right, so um, some hit it on the nose. What it is is that this study shows the reflection of the overall injury rates. Yes, they used a, um, a different um, measurement, which is per 100 uh, athletes. Um, and again, you always have to be very careful, Sam. So eluding the 1,000 player hours was comparative, you should do. All right, please, in the future, everyone, if you cannot compare apples to apples or oranges to oranges, just state that. And when you would state, the finding was, you know, 18.6 injuries in rugby per 100 participating athletes. It is important to uh, understand and to know going forward when you're writing. Okay, all? Um, but again, uh, this is amazing that they're getting all this data from the Knox uh, National Olympic Committees, right? So just to put in perspective, there's 216, um, you know, uh, nations, right? Uh, or two, there was 205 National Olympic Committees last time I checked, I think. Um, of them, we could just say that there's about 122, 123 um, rugby countries. So basically, of the 205 knocks, let's say that was the last number, whatever, uh, 200 countries can enter a team into the Olympics. So there's 205 National Olympic Committees. Of those 205, there's 122 that could submit a rugby team because they're rugby nations that are part of world rugby. So you first have to become a member of the global governing body FIFA, World Rugby. Once you're a member of that, then you could submit that team, or in theory, submit a bid to submit a team for the Olympics. Everyone get that, I hope. Um, the unique thing about that is, so you're telling me there's 80 countries just learning how to play rugby and to create a team. That's our niche. There are 80 countries that are trying to learn rugby 15s as well as rugby 7s. And both of them are very different. Now, if you go to the injuries, uh, go to your next slide there, Sam. Please. Uh, we'll go to that, that one. So, this was also very, very unique. Dr. Fuller did the paper on the Rio Olympics in rugby. And there was a much lower upper extremity uh, concussion rate found. Well, think about it. You're on what? The national stage. So less likely are people going to tackle haphazardly um, or tackle awkwardly or they won't do a full wrap tackle. If you do a full wrap tackle, or if you um, execute the shoulder wrap tackle that's expected in rugby, it's inherently injury preventive, right? Because you wrap around the legs of the opposing player, you put your head to the left of their hips, you're supposed to be tackling where your hips are level with your head, so that means your eyes are up, and so you should not be, in theory, injured or injured in a severe way. And that's why, if you look at your anatomical locations, here for the overall, there's very little upper extremity injury. Something very unique in our populations where we have a very high upper extremity injury rate. So it's just something, a little, a little point to note what occurs at the very upper echelon of sport at the Olympic level, there's less poor play or less unskilled or less 
technical, depending how you want to term it. Just wanted to bring that point up. Uh, does anyone have any questions on that? Uh, thank you so much for that presentation, Sam. Thank you. And, uh, and thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you for those who have joined us on the call. And um, that will be ending our today's series. And we will join you next week.